You heard this morning that we're talking about impact that comes from other places that you, you might not have expected it. And what I think one thing we really underestimate in this area where we're talking about capital markets, we're talking about impact through capital markets, is that there's a lot of people making impact through those capital markets in a different way, through activism, through campaigning. And we have someone here with us tonight who brings down the house every year at Personal Democracy Forum, who is a celebrity in this world of activism and organizing. And I just think I'm so impressed with her and uh, really wanted the SOCAP audience to hear these other ways that people are having impact, tremendous impact, and making huge social and environmental change. So please welcome Christy George from New Media Ventures and Taryn steinbrickner Kaufman from Some of Us. Um, I was just saying to Lindsay, it was quite sadistic to put us after guy with guitar. Like, we're not going to be able to sing for you, but um, knowing that we are the last thing between you and a drink, we will try to make it as interesting as possible. Um, and I'm, short. Yeah, <laughs> short and interesting. I'm Christy George. I'm the director of New Media Ventures. Uh, we are a seed fund and network of angel investors focused on media and technology startups that create progressive change. And um, I've been coming to SOCAP for many years and speaking at SOCAP. And one of the things that I'm so excited about today is the integration of politics and activism into the conversation around impact investing. So we were really proud a couple of years ago to have Taryn come into our orbit and to be able to support her work at some of us. And I think um, you are in for a treat in hearing how she's grown that organization um, from just her, to uh, quite a global behemoth. So, um, Taryn, why don't we just start? Tell us, why did you start Some of Us? What is it? Why should people in this room care? Yeah. Um, so, Some of Us is uh, over 5 million consumers, investors, and workers around the world working together to uh, push companies to be more responsible, and socially, environmentally, um, politically, getting money out of politics, and so on. Uh, and the reason that we're new is because the way we do that is online and in global internet access, as you know, is like a relatively new phenomenon historically. Um, and so the idea that you could get, you know, 200,000 consumers overnight to express um, concern about an issue to a company from 180 different countries, that's a new thing. Um, and that's what we do. And the reason that I think this is so important is because... Uh, Major global corporations, as you know, are uh, the most among the most important political actors in the world. And in fact, like of the top hundred world economies, um, something like half of them are corporations, not countries. And so, when you're thinking like, who are the people in the world who can change people's lives? It's not just presidents and prime ministers; it's CEOs. Um, and often, that change can happen much more quickly um, than political change. Um, and I came to this work because uh, I came out of the climate movement, and uh, I worked in the lead up to Copenhagen in 2009, the big climate conference that was a total and complete failure, and took a sort of step back from that and was like, well, I'm an American citizen. The reason that we cannot get this global treaty that everybody knows is the right thing for the world like, everybody knows the policy solutions. This isn't a, a mystery. It's purely a power problem. But the reason we can't get that treaty is because of the U.S. I'm an American citizen. So I came back in 2010 and worked to try and get a climate bill passed in the U.S. Also a total and complete failure, as you might remember. Um, and again, the sort of the next step back is, well, why? Why can't we get a global treaty? Because of the U.S. Why can't we get a U.S. treaty? because of the stranglehold that the fossil fuel industry has on Washington. There's no way around it. That's the answer. Um, and so I'm going to do what I can to try and hold corporations accountable, because they really are the power players on most issues. So is that the problem that you would say some of us is explicitly solving? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, we haven't solved all the world's problems yet. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is that, you know, uh, in some ways, the economy and the marketplace is actually a more democratic forum than politics. Uh, there's literally no politician in the world who cares what every single person on earth thinks of them. Mm. 
Um, even the Secretary General of the UN, like there's a lot of people on Earth that they really just don't care about. But Pepsi, like Pepsi literally cares what every single person in the world thinks of them and with not that much difference in how much they care. You know, an American consumer might only be worth 10 times as much to them as like the poorest person in the world, frankly. Um, and so that the ability to mobilize people around the world to hold corporations accountable seemed really potentially quite powerful. And we've seen a huge amount of uh, success in this, in this strategy. Can you give us a couple of examples of the consumer advocacy campaigns you've run? Because I think what is, um, at least as grant makers, what has been so exciting for us is how you are winning, essentially, campaigns. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot more fun than politics a lot of the time. <laughs> um, um, so uh, one example that's really relevant right now in California that I'm excited about is, I mean, we have a drought, as I'm sure you all know, and it's not just here, it's up and down the whole West Coast. Um, and Nestle is bottling groundwater in California uh, and selling it for a profit right now. And they're do, they want to start doing that in Oregon. They are, have also been doing it in British Columbia. In fact, in British Columbia, um, the water rate was, I'm not making this up, was $2.25 per, let me make sure I'm getting this right, per million liters of groundwater is what they were paying the British Columbian government. Um, and so we, you know, stopping Nestle from doing this would be awesome in and of itself, but it's also an entree into a larger conversation because Nestle is a very relatable brand for consumer, consumers. Um, and so we're running campaigns up and down the West Coast. Uh, in California, we held a rally outside of a Nestle bottling plant um, that got national press coverage a few months ago. Um, in Oregon, we're fighting the new state law that would allow Nestle to do the same thing that they're doing in California. And in British Columbia, we actually had a big win. Uh, we after we got we had a petition that went totally viral calling on the state government to uh, change the way that they treat water rates and had 225,000 people signed it and we took it delivered it huge delivery um, lots of press and the British Columbian government agreed and is currently uh, changing in the process it'll you know we don't know what the outcome is going to be yet but they entered a process they were not in because of our campaign and so that was really exciting and as I said, it's, it's allowed us to start a bigger conversation with 5 million consumers around the world about water privatization issues. One thing that I've heard people say about some of us that is interesting from an activism perspective is that uh, people think of traditional activism as wholly oppositional. Mm -hmm. And one thing that is also interesting about what you do is the way you think about having a positive influence on companies as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, companies are not monolithic, right? Uh, and there are lots of people inside every company who want to be go doing good or want at least to be doing better, but they often don't have the power to make that happen. And so what we actually see ourselves doing a lot of the time is providing those internal voices with like more sort of external stuff they can point to and letting, giving them like a leg to stand on. Well, if you've got 200,000 consumers who've expressed anger about this thing, then you can call a meeting about it and maybe some people will come whereas before you couldn't. Um, or if you, if you force the social media people and the comms people and to spend, you know, to spend two days working on this issue, it's gonna get to a much higher level in the organization than it might otherwise. So it's not like, you know, we don't, <laughs> most people in the world work for big corporations, right? It's not like we think that all those people are evil or something, um, but the way that the incentive structures are set up, it's, it's not, you know, Mm -hmm. It's not easy to, to do good always, so. You started doing consumer advocacy campaigns, but you have also done a lot of work in the shareholder activism world. I suspect that there are people in this audience who have been quite active in that world. Can you tell us how that manifests in the context of some of us? Yeah. Um, so I really think consumer organizing and shareholder advocacy go hand in hand. And that's one thing actually that if, if you're gonna take something away from this, that's a big one for those of you who work um, as, you know, in shareholder advocacy or in related fields. Like I think there's sort of a division, like we don't, the people in those worlds don't know each other, the people in the consumer organizing world and the shareholder world don't know each other very well.
but if you're a shareholder, you're trying to get a company to do something, you have to demonstrate a financial risk. Um, and consumers are the ones who are the financial risk a lot of the time. And so, you know, we look for issues where shareholders are doing work and we look to channel and express consumers' frustration around that in a demonstrable way. So you can say there's 200,000 people who are worried about this thing. Um, we also actually act as shareholders um, sometimes. So we file shareholder resolutions. We filed a resolution on behalf of some of our members who own shares in Amazon uh, earlier this year and got Amazon. Amazon is notoriously unresponsive to consumer campaigns, um, but this was around the working conditions in Amazon warehouses and filed a resolution asking for disclosure um, around those conditions and got it on the, the ballot and Amazon was much, much, much more responsive to that um, than they had been to other groups' consumer campaigns. Um, and another great example was Kinder Morgan. It's a Canadian extractives uh, company that's trying to build a pipeline, as many Canadian extractives companies are, and it's going through the land of the Tsleil Watooth First Nation in Alberta. Um, and so we worked with that, with that First Nation, and we crowdfunded a tour from, from our members donated to, um, and we, we accompanied the, the uh, leaders of the, the First Nation group to Wall Street and got them meetings with JP Morgan, with Goldman Sachs, um, and with eight, eight different institutional investors that represented 10.5% of Kinder Morgan's shares. Um, and those investors had only been told so far that everything was on track, mm -hmm and that you know, the, it was gonna be approved and don't worry and everything's fine and they didn't know that the First Nations groups were fighting the pipeline actually until we met with them. Um, and since then it's actually been a whole reversal. Um, again, it's gonna be years before we actually know the outcome but there's just a five month delay announced um, an Alberta oil, in, uh, oil newspaper, not a progressive lefty rag at all, uh, said that the whole thing had been a public relations nightmare for Kinder mm -hmm. Morgan um, so those are the kinds of things, and, and you know we would love to work with more shareholder advocacy groups. So, the, I'm sort of interested in how you characterized one company as notoriously unresponsive, and then there's sort of ways you can move them up the ladder toward responsiveness. At some level, it seems like there's partly a question of people just didn't know. In this sort of in this example, it was like they didn't know these people existed. Is that typically what is the difference, or are there other differences? that move people it at the really end It really depends. Day. I mean, Walmart is a totally different kettle of fish mm -hmm. from, you know, a small company that has never had a PR crisis before. I mean, you guys are all involved, you're on boards of companies, like, you know, the different PR experiences, different comms experiences. So it's often, you know, as consumers, we're often like, this is a really important issue, and we get nothing, right? <laughs> and then this is a really important issue. No, let's yell it louder. Let's do it in this other way. And then you get something that bites, and suddenly you get, you know. Somebody once told me, like, if you can just make it something that the CEO has to think about, like, once a week, then, and it, you might, you know, like, CEOs don't want to have to think about your campaign once a week, so... I think that seems like a pretty good shorthand. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to pivot a little bit to Some of Us' is model. So Some of Us is a nonprofit organization. At New Media Ventures, we make uh, for-profit investments, debt equity investments, as well as grants. And, um, you know, people tend to think of ROI in terms of investment and then think of grant making as simply giving money away. And so I'm interested in how you think of um, both Some of Us' revenue model, which I think would be helpful for people to hear, and um, how you think of sort of return on investment in the context of a nonprofit. Yeah. Um, my big top line here would be that it's maybe counterintuitive, but actually, in some cases, giving to nonprofits is a better investment than investing in a for profit company. And by that, I mean if your bottom line is impact and change, which I assume many, that's why many of you are here. Um, we, you, you, there are nonprofits that are actually revenue generating and that require investment in order to generate that revenue, and we're one of them. Um, so we've taken less than $3 million in major donor and foundation funding since we launched, and we're currently raising online a million dollars a quarter um, in small dollar donations. So if you think about that, the, our early investors, of which New Media Ventures is one, and their investment group, um, the investors that work through them, 
are usually those investors have already had a 10 to 20 times okay. payoff in terms of revenue generated for progressive change. Um, and that's just to date, right? That's going to continue to pay off for as long as we're raising money from small, do small dollar donors. So that's, uh, yeah, think about it that way, right? Like you could invest in something and get the money back and then try to give it away for good, but you could also invest in the good thing that's revenue generating to begin with. Um, How do you, you know, there's a lot of hand-wringing within this community, since you mentioned impact is presumably the bottom line of every single person in this room, about how exactly to measure that impact, um, especially in the context of a campaigning organization. You've got the campaign wins, but the kind of change you're seeking is quite long-term. How do you think about measuring impact or how, and, you know, how might that be instructive for all of us? Yeah, it's, uh, it's really hard, right? <laughs> Has anybody got a perfect solution? Because I'd love to hear it. Um, I listened to the panel earlier today talking about this, and I think in many ways the impact investing community is ahead of the campaigning community in measuring impact, um, but I think we also have lessons to share. Uh, and one of the lessons for me is to, like, you think, if you think about your theory of change, right, some, um, the thing that you do that makes this other thing happen, that makes this other thing happen, that makes this other thing happen, that means that, like, more poor people have food right, or whatever it is, whatever your theory of change is, um, it's often really hard to test that the thing you're doing, which is giving money to some company, is going to result in more people having more food. But you can test the links along the way of the chain. You may not be able to test all of them. But so, like, the one thing I would say is, like, keep your eyes open for the links that you can test. So an example of this in campaigning is we pour untold resources into getting people to make phone calls to Congress, right, um, as a movement. And actually, you know, there's a lot of reasons to think that that works, um, that that has effect. But nobody's ever run a controlled trial to see whether it actually does. And it wouldn't be that hard. Um, you could use a state legislature as a testing bed. And you could generate, p pick half of the state legislators randomly on some issue that they don't get lobbied on a lot and generate phone calls to that half and not to the other half and see if it affects how they vote. Um, and that's something, that, that kind of thinking about like where are the links in the chain that you could test and making sure you actually test them. And I think the other thing I would say, which I don't think the campaigning world does a great job of, but I would, I'm trying to change that, is, um, is that you should be investing actual resources in measuring your impact like, if you invest 10% of all your resources in measuring your impact, and that makes you 20% more effective, then you've won, right? You've won that game. And it's not that hard to get 20% more effective by ch if you, like, really work at it. So I think that's, you know, that's a way to think about it. Will you tell us, as we're sort of wrapping up, what you're most excited about now in terms of some <laughs> of us' as future and uh, what we should expect from you? Yeah, well, year. so actually, you know, this is a little wonky, but the thing that I'm most excited about right now is technology. Um, our sector has not really adapted the digital, you know, move on, like you get a lot of emails, some of them are donation asks. That's still the, the, the model that we all use in um, digital campaigning, progressive campaigning. And the world has changed a lot since that model was invented. Like, people are now reading all their email on their phone. Frankly, they don't really like email very much, whereas it used to be really personal. Um, and we're building a world-class technology team in-house to try and figure out how you use WhatsApp and how you use um, uh, apps on your phone to try and mobilize more people and just get millions and millions more people engaged. Thank you for that. Um, as we wrap up, I was sort of thinking about my takeaways from your uh, points, and I, I think I'm thinking a lot about, one, keeping all of our eyes open for links that might reveal impact along the sort of chain of our work, um, two, also to consider nonprofit impact um, as potentially more efficient than some of the for-profit investments we might make, and then uh, last, to create a campaign that keeps the CEO uh, thinking once a week, and it seems like we'll be able to solve everything. <laughs> um, just join me, please, in uh, thanking Taryn Steinbrickner-Kaufman and sharing some of her wisdom and today. And thank you, Christy. Yeah. <laughs>